It, it is my pri privilege to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Mr. Gene Krantz. Gene joined NASA in 1960 as chief of the flight operations branch. He served as one of the original Project Mercury assistant flight directors and as flight director for the Gemini program. In 1969, he became chief of the flight control division and served as flight director for Apollo and Skylab. <clears throat> Among his achievements during Apollo was serving as flight director for the first lunar landing of Apollo 11 and playing a lead role in the Mission Control Center's successful efforts to return Apollo 13. Gene has been awarded many awards, as you might imagine, two NASA Exceptional Service Medals, three NASA Distinguished Service Medals, AIAA's Lawrence Speary Award, the AAS Space Flight Award, the Robert R. Gilruth Award, the Arthur S. Fleming Award, the National Space Club Astronautics Engineer Award, the St. Louis University President's Award, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and four Presidential Rank Awards. It is my distinct honor this evening to introduce our speaker, Mr. Gene Cramp. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I guess we better mod. I tend to yell, so you probably want to turn the uh, volume down on your uh, control unit there. It's a real pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to be here in uh, Huntsville uh, this evening and have the opportunity to uh, speak to operators. You know, operations is literally an art. It's really something where virtually every day you're faced with decisions. No ambiguity, go or no go, stay or no stay, launch or hold. So it's really uh, a great opportunity to basically congratulate you on the uh, career selection that you've made. You know, I was, uh, I was a young fighter pilot in Korea uh, flying the F-86. And one day I came down from a flight, and my crew chief told me that the Soviet Union had launched a Sputnik. And I had no clue what they were talking about, except that this was a small basketball-sized satellite that was uh, circling the Earth. And I could look up to the heavens and say, there's some new object up there, and I don't understand what it's all about. I also had a high level of frustration because when we were over in Korea, we could see the Soviet MiGs with about a 2,000-foot altitude advantage on us. And this was a concern. So literally, another nation had captured the high ground in space. I came and did a couple years as a flight test engineer in the early jet bombers, the B-52 and B-47. And then I saw an advertisement in Aviation Week that indicated they were forming a space task group. And they're looking for qualified engineers to determine the feasibility of putting an American in space. I thought, gee, that sounds like a pretty cool job. So I filled out the standard government form 52, sent it in. Didn't hear anything from NASA. And uh, now I was faced with the career choice, what am I going to do? And about the time I was either going to go back out to Edwards with one of the F-4s or go back to uh, St. Louis, and I got a call. And they said, are you still interested? And I said, certainly. They said, when can you report? And I said, give me a couple of weeks. So two weeks later, I was back at Langley Field in Virginia, and we went into pool because they were still setting up the structure of the Space Task Group, and they had a launch operations under Merritt Preston, and they had recovery operations under Jerry Hammock, and they had trajectory design under Johnny Mayer, and, and you didn't know who I'd be working for. So they gave you a whole bunch of manuals, and I studied these manuals and got reasonably familiar with what a spacecraft looked like, which was the pointy end, that was the end that went up. And uh, two weeks after I was on the job, gentleman comes up, taps me in the shoulder, and says, I'm Chris Kraft, you're working for me. And I want you to go down to the Cape and write a countdown, write some mission rules, and when you're through, give me a call and we'll come down and launch. Operations at that time was sort of like playing 
uh, sandlot baseball, where you throw the bat and you move up and you get chicken claws up in the top, and that's the guy who gets the first choice at picking the players. And that was basically the nature of operations as we moved into the Mercury program. At the time that we started, our world was vastly different. Our nation would soon be torn by the beginning of the conflict in Vietnam. During that decade of the 60s, we would see three political assassinations. And the civil rights movement was just emerging within the nation. The Cold War with the Soviet Union provided the stimulus for the space program that guided every aspect of America's foreign policy. Computers existed only in laboratories. There are no global communications. And in that decade, American students would riot in the campuses. And then in 1961, a young, brash, and articulate President John F. Kennedy issued a challenge. He said, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And issued this challenge as we were struggling to put a spacecraft into orbit. One month prior to the speech, we had blown up our second Atlas rocket. Eleven days prior to the speech, we had launched Alan Shepard, so we had a total of 20 minutes manned spaceflight experience. We'd never been to orbit, and we were directed to go to the moon. So engineers and people experienced in flight test, and a small group of 31 Canadians and Englishmen from the Cracker Jack Avro Aero flight test team joined with the Mercury 7 astronauts at Langley Field in Virginia to form a space task group that would win supremacy in space. Our boss was Walt Williams. Walt was the toughest man I have ever known. He was a brawler. He was more fitted to working as a longshoreman in New York or San Diego or San Francisco than leading the American space program. But in the business of aircraft flight tests, Williams was a legend. He was the pioneer director of the NACA high-speed test station that today we call Edwards Air Force Base. And he was a project manager for the X-1 rocket ship that in 1947 took Chuck Yeager and the world into the age of supersonic flight. William's deputy was prophetically named Christopher Columbus Kraft. Chris developed the concept for space flight operations. He directed the implementation of the worldwide tracking network, launched each one of the Mercury missions, but most importantly, he was the mentor, the teacher, the tutor for the first generation of young people that became known as mission controllers. Mercury Control did not have a single computer. There were three mainframe computers supporting all of Project Mercury. Two of these mainframes were 700 miles north of the Cape at Greenbelt, Maryland, Goddard Space Flight Center, because IBM did not trust us to operate computers. <laughs> and these machines were the first solid state machines ever produced by IBM. On the island of Bermuda, we put a reliable vacuum tube computer because we, we uh, and we always launched eastward over the island such that if we lost communications with our crew during powered flight, the team in place would tell the astronauts what to do when the engine shut down. Global communications consisted of a 60-word-per-minute teletype network that dated back to the days of America's Pony Express, the 1860s. So after a couple weeks training in spacecraft systems and operations, and after we all became very proficient in Morse code, because Morse code was our backup form of communication, within the ground tracking network as well as between the team on the ground and the crew in space. Once we achieved this proficiency, we sent young men to 13 tracking stations around the world. They went into the heart of Africa, they went to Zanzibar, Australia, ships at sea and islands in the Pacific. These were sites that were literally at the ends of the earth. And the risk to the young people at the sites was very high because the 60s was the end of the European colonial period. 